All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out today. I am honestly kind of out of my mind excited to share what some of the students have been working on. You know, Sarah and I both have been involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem here as students for five years or something. And this is just a small subset of what students are working on, but some really exciting initiatives that we're super stoked to talk about. So later on, this like group of dapper individuals over here is a Catamount Innovation Fund. They're like a student-led accelerator program, kind of like Shark Tank, but run by students. So we're gonna hear from them in a little while, but we're gonna start by talking about a new program at the university called the Academic Research Commercialization Program, or ARC for short. And if we're being entirely honest, we came up with the acronym ARC before we decided what it stood for, because we thought it had a nice ring to it, like the ARC program. I don't know, we liked it. But anyway, our mission is to commercialize innovative tech, create new startups, and most importantly, train the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders. So since this is a new program, we wanna tell you a little bit about the story of how it got started. Um, so my name is Skylar, I'm a senior, I'm studying sustainable technology commercialization. And I'm Sarah, I'm also a senior, and I'm studying business administration. And so earlier today, you heard from a lot of folks that have a lot of um, you know, pedigree and a lot of PhDs and stuff, and our claim to fame is that we're both uh, college dropouts. Mm -hmm and proud of that. So we both, we both dropped out of school previously to found startups, and they didn't work out, but it was a lot of fun. We learned a ton and kind of developed a passion for, for entrepreneurship. So when we decided to come back and finish our degrees, we got involved in the UVM Entrepreneurship Club and kind of had that same idea of looking for problems and trying to build solutions that's kind of integral to, to entrepreneurship. And through our leadership in the Entrepreneurship Club, we met with Kirk Dombrowski from, where, where's, where's he at? Oh, he's out, he took a call out there, hey. And, uh, and learned about a problem that we thought would be kind of cool to solve. The problem that we heard about was the valley of death. And this is the gap between research that's leaving the lab and startups in, over there in industry land. And once we started digging deeper into this problem, we realized there were a multitude of problems. So re researchers themselves are really busy people. They're teaching classes, they're inventing new things and trying to get them out of the labs. And at the end of the day, they really don't have a lot of time to turn these ventures into startups. And on the other side of things, there's the students who have this creative and entrepreneurial drive that don't really get the opportunities to make these ventures work. So together with the Vice President for Research Office and UVM Innovation, Eric Munson, and so many other helpful folks, we came up with what we think is kind of a cool approach to this. And it's called the ARC program. And it's totally student-led. And the way that it works is we start by scouting technologies that we think are pretty cool and have the potential for huge commercial impact. We then recruit a team of students from all across campus. Now, this isn't just business and entrepreneurship students, but engineers and artists and psychology students, so that when we get a team together, they're looking at problems from diverse perspectives. We put them in a room together, we give them entrepreneurial mentorship and training, and by combining cool tech with awesome diverse trained teams, the hope is that we get some really impactful startups out of that program. And to be entirely honest, it's so much fun, because we just get students from different backgrounds with different life stories, different experience, traditional and non-traditional students together in a room in some awesome spaces here at Hula and at VSET and, and unite them towards a common goal of creating new world-changing tech. Like how is that not just the most fun thing ever? And it's great, the community is so supportive and energetic and I think that community of students working together is something that is kind of worth getting excited about and trying to replicate. So to see if this concept had any legs, we were really fortunate enough to pilot it with a technology called Panic Mechanic that you heard about earlier. It was founded by Professor Ryan and Ellen McGinnis, and boy did we luck out, because they're inducted into the Hall of Fame for a reason. They're really, really awesome professors to work with, put a lot of trust in the student team, and after working with them for a year, we were able to raise, as a venture, over $100,000 in grant funding and private investment. We were able to be one of the first teams out of the University of Vermont to go through the National Science Foundation National i -Corps Teams program with a student as the entrepreneurial lead, which, is, to my knowledge, has not happened before. And like we talked about earlier today, really engage with industry and form partnerships. And one of those that I'm incredibly excited about is we formed a partnership with a platform called Promly that's working to reduce teen suicide rates. So the technology developed right here at UVM is now gonna go to help the next generation improve their mental health. And if that's not like an outcome of research and tech commercialization to get excited about, then I'm not sure what is. Um, so needless to say, we were really stoked with how the pilot went and the story's not over yet. So like keep an eye out, some things we can't say publicly yet that's really exciting that we're gonna, uh, that's coming. So, so keep an eye out for that pilot. But perhaps more exciting beyond just the impact on the technology is what a program like this does for the community. 
So we talked a lot earlier about trying to retain you know, young talent in the state and how that's an asset that we care a lot about. In the ARC program over just the last year, we've created 14 paid positions for students to work locally in the state of Vermont to build new businesses. And this is hands-on entrepreneurial experience that students basically never get in their undergrad. It's a really unique opportunity for them to talk as peers with professionals and entrepreneurs and get all of the kind of confidence and experience that comes from that. And what it does is really open students' eyes to what the opportunities are here in the state of Vermont and what opportunities there are just for themselves to have an impact and launch their own lives um, and careers. And we are really excited. Over the past two years, we have had over 70 applicants from across 20 different majors. Our first year, we were able to accept eight students onto the first ARC team, and this year we were able to accept 10. And we've loved watching them grow, and we're really excited to announce that Nicole Ian, who is sitting right there, is going to be the new director of the ARC program. She started out with us. Yes, give her a round of applause. <laughs> She started out with us last year as a team member and worked her way up to head of partnerships last summer. This year, she's the team lead for Verde, Verde Technologies, and next year, she's going to be the new ARC director, so we're very happy. Yeah, and I want to say, the students that come out of the ARC program, and pardon my French, lack, for lack of a better term, are total badasses. They take like the confidence and experience that they've had in this program and go on to accomplish amazing things, whether that's presidential leadership fellowships, getting into you know, venture capital training programs that undergrads basically are never even allowed in normally. They go on to get job offers. They win honors awards. Like The list goes on and on and on, but I want to say truly, I believe the team of students all right over here, I really believe are the next kind of generation of leaders, and I hope that we kind of continue to support them having these kind of experiences because the outcomes are pretty awesome, um, in my opinion. And now, all of what we just talked about, the whole team of students, everything that we think we've accomplished in this program, is 100% only because of the support that we get from the community, not just in UVM, but also more broadly. So it is pretty rare that a group of undergrad students puts together an idea for like a program and then has the vice president say, yep, I like it, I'm gonna fund it and figure out all the details as you go, like build the plane as you fly it. And then to have admin actually support us through that entire process and work with us collaboratively as peers. That's kind of a trust in students that, that I had never seen before and was something that's been you know, incredibly rewarding for, for me personally and for everybody in the ARC program. And so we're so appreciative of that support. But then the community has just like welcomed us with open arms. So the Vermont Tech Council is currently funding internships in the program. VSET and Hula have welcomed us into their communities. And the kind of happenstance of running into entrepreneurs and mentors in those spaces has been incredibly valuable. And there are also other resources all across the state. So, you know, the Black River Innovation Campus, the Small Business Development Center, um, that we've probably met with uh, 50 times or more for advice and mentorship. So there's an awesome community out here, and the students clearly have shown um, that they're more than willing to engage and get a lot out of that experience. So you weren't really here to hear us blab, you're really here to hear about the awesome technologies that the students are working on. Um, so one of them you heard a little bit about earlier, and it's in the next generation of underground scanning and mapping technology from DeepSense Tech. And we're also gonna hear about some pretty awesome new thin film flexible solar panel tech coming out of Verde Technologies. How many times can I say the word technologies in the same slide, right? And one of the things I just wanna highlight before I get the students up on here is this particular group, even just at the beginning of the semester, didn't even necessarily, some of them, know like what a startup or a business pitch was. And the growth that, they, the growth that they've gone through over the last three months has been honestly one of the most gratifying things I've ever witnessed. You're gonna see them, and they're doing an awesome job at something they didn't even know about just a few months ago. They've done literally 100 customer discovery interviews plus over the last three months, created dozens of different pitch decks that they've worked through. Um, and so we're gonna show them a lot of love, we're gonna show them a lot of support, and the whole purpose of this event is to try to you know, better kind of get them exposure to the community. So come up after, like give them feedback, say hi to them, give them some love and support. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna to welcome to the stage Nicole Eaton leading the Verde Technologies team. Let's lower the mic because I'm short. Okay, there we go. Big things and small packages. <laughs> yes, I love that. All right, I'm just gonna, okay, perfect. So hi everyone, I'm Nicole. Um, we are Verde Technologies and we are accelerating the next generation um, of the uh, solar panel technology and 
let's get started. So a huge problem right now is that installing solar sucks. It's really expensive, but it's also impractical sometimes. Up to 40% of the cost of solar is installation, system design, and permitting. It can also be more if you're trying to install solar on atypical roofs. So that is like what you see on the screen right now. And especially in Vermont, we have so many farms. And right at home, we have the Gutterson Fieldhouse where you can't have solar because it's a curved roof. Also, 80% of Americans can't access solar because of the roof suitability problems, but also the cost. So we are presenting a thin film flexible solar panel using profs guides. Now this solar panel is affordable. It reduces installation costs by about a third. Now right now, especially when installing on commercial rooftops, solar installers have to hire external people because the labor is just too intensive and that costs a lot of money. It's also 75% lighter. We do, it's like a roll on, roll out solar panel. It has an adhesive backing, so we don't have those heavy ballast mounting systems. It's also something that you can mount anywhere due to that adhesive backing and the flexibility of it. And so it's just a logistically simpler model. And then lastly, it is highly efficient, which I know may be a concern as well. Right now in the lab, we are projected to reach 28% efficiency, and on the field for tr traditional solar, solar panels are usually about 18 to 22%. So it is a really big jump, and it's impressive. So the market we're looking at right now is US rooftop solar markets. Right now, the market is about $66 billion, and it's growing by 6% annually. The market we specifically see ourselves thriving in, though, is big box stores and commercial rooftops. There's about 100,000 rooftops out there that can't have solar because of the low load concerns and because of what I said before, the heavy mounting ballast systems. And with our panels, we can reduce those because we don't have any mounting systems. It's just the adhesive backing rolling on to the commercial sized roofs. So this not only makes it more aesthetically pleasing, but it's also affordable. And as I said before, it's just a lot more simple. So here is our competitive analysis. Right now in the market, silicon crystalline, monocrystalline silicon is the most commonly used uh, for solar. But we are going to be using perovskite. So what makes perovskite so exciting? Well, it's high efficiency, it's high flexibility and stability, all for a low cost. Well, you might ask yourself, then why is it not number one in the market, right? Well, that's because of its low lifespan. But our technology is already solving this problem and opening up doors to making perovskite dominate the market. Our business model is simple. We are going to be partnering with manufacturers and we're gonna be selling directly to solar installers. Solar installers are responsible to selling to homeowners. To support this beautiful business plan, we interview dozens of installers companies across the US, and they are all so enthusiastic about our technology and applying it to their business model. Our go-to-market strategy has three phases. While well, phase one is partnering with local manufacturers and local installers to test our, our technology on all different types of roofs. Phase two is all about growing our sales and expanding our network. Phase three is expanding our market by installing on commercial si commercial sized roofs and selling to third parties. So we've had the opportunity of working with wonderful researchers, Chad and Randy, who are really excited about revolutionizing the solar market uh, through our perovskite technology. Um, and they established, um, they designed and built a lab at the University of Vermont, um, out of which three patents um, regarding uh, manufacturing practices um, uh, came out. And so they are busy people, um, as, as Skylar and Sarah mentioned. Um, 
and they needed some help on bringing that technology to market. And that's exactly where the ARC team came in. Uh, we are a group of diverse, uh, passionate, and creative students that are really excited about the link um, between technology and business. So as a team, we identified that key metrics are integral in uh, developing our business um, as we have action, actionable steps to uh, measuring our success. Um, so number one, we want to launch our product within two years. We want to achieve lower than competitor, competitor input prices. And we also want to improve our system payback to within six years. Now, these are very ambitious goals. And just given the nature of tough tech, um, we understand that it's going to take some money uh, in order to get there. So we're estimating around $2 million um, will be necessary for, for developing our business. So as has been a theme throughout our entire presentation, uh, manufacturers and installers are really a focal point of our business. And so our first step in the stage that we're at now is really solidifying those connections with manufacturers and installers like FlexCon um, in order to define our goals and really understand what our niche market is. Um, and so using that insight, uh, we are conducting our pre-seed um, funding and working with groups like the engine um, in order to acquire that money um, and apply for grants um, to, to ultimately get to a place where we can launch uh, a minimum viable product and ultimately a um, go-to-market product. And once those are established, um, we hope to conduct our seed round funding, um, which will allow us to um, scale up and ultimately sell um, all over the country. So we want to thank you all for listening to this quick pitch presentation. But more importantly, please feel free to approach us after um, this whole event to give us advice on not only this pitch deck, but how we can go forward in terms of fundraising. And before I end, we just all want to reiterate that we strongly believe that our new thin film solar technology can accelerate the re renewable energy transition. And we want you all to come along on that journey. So thank you. Two or three questions, anyone? Can be about the program, our experiences, or the tech itself, anything? Yes, Kirk. The one piece that you brought up was the lifespan of the technology once it's installed, and you said there's some great progress in, in figuring that out. Can you say a little bit more about that, what the time frame is on that? In terms of like the efficiency in the lab and stuff like that? Yeah, so we've, as I mentioned, like efficiency is huge in the solar industry. And so Randy's sitting right there. He's one of the researchers. Um, going along, we project to get 20% efficiency. And in terms of date wise, we hope to have a product out commercially in about two years. Um, but in terms of reaching that efficiency, it's within the next couple of months. Um, so we'll see that very soon and then going in the market hopefully two years. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to answer this, but um, there are other companies, as Dorcas was saying in that competitive analysis, perovskite is like a relatively new material and there's currently like Oxford PV and other companies doing that. but. Since it is relatively new, there's really no company like thriving in this market right now. And we are specifically focusing on perovskites, um, other like rather than silicon, which is in traditional solar panels. So that's what kind of makes us different. What's the lifespan? Mm, about, I don't know, right now, I'm unsure, but hopefully like, what is it, 20 something years? Yeah. And just like she said, uh, this is a, a new area of, of solar and it's still developing. So right now it's about 20 years, but there's potential for more. So 
the more we, um, we spend our time uh, bettering our technology, there's more potential for more better efficiency and just uh, better lifespan, that's all. Yeah, so we actually have, can we get the slides back up or would that be possible? Um, in our appendix, we, we included a 180-day uh, um, budget, and that's more specific to the technology itself in terms of materials. Um, and just based on our um, relationships and, um, and uh, conversations, it's the next one. Or two. Oh, I don't think it's in there. Oh, it's not in there. Anyway, um, just based on our conversations with um, the uh, accelerator program that we're working with, um, the engine, and along with just some of our advisors, um, we estimated that um, from a business side of things, given that it's in early stage and it's tough tech, like, you know, we're sort of going to be needing to account for the fact that there's, there's a lot of external ex expenses that um, come into, you know, besides the, the 180-day for, forecast, which is around $500,000. Um, so that's kind of a rough, rough estimate based on uh, kind of industry leaders and their insights. Um, again, that's, you know, kind of a rough estimate. We're not, we currently are, we're still in like the prototype phase, so we haven't physically experimented on different types of roofs, um, but that's definitely something that we're going to do with the future funds we have and definitely something that we always are thinking about. And that's why we would definitely be uh, partnering with local manufacturers and installers to make sure that we test our solar before we uh, completely launch into the market. All right, awesome job, Verde Technologies. They've actually never, we never practiced Q&As before, so that was like the first size, so now I think they did pretty good. Some of the questions are like the key questions top researchers are trying to solve themselves, so they're like challenging questions, so I think you guys handled them well. Next, I'm incredibly excited to announce Deep Sense Tech, led by team lead, Will Jeffries. Hi, thank you so much for coming out. Sarah, Skylar, thank you so much. Um, so let's keep the good energy flowing and let's start off with a little, little bet. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Shelburne Road, the roundabout right outside, the massive construction project. Who thinks it will actually be completed on time in 2023? Anyone thinks it will be completed on time? A few people? Okay. <laughs> Well, if you raised your hand, I've got some bad news for you. If past projects in Burlington are any indication, chances are this will probably be affecting your commute for much longer than expected. So why is this? One of the biggest challenges when upgrading infrastructure is navigating the complex network of underground utilities. We have heard time and time again that the maps currently available to locate these utilities are often inaccurate or missing entirely. As a consequence, these projects often tend to go over budget or cause massive disruptions in everyday life. And in 2019 alone, costing over $61 billion in damages. As our world moves towards a more sustainable future, so must our infrastructure. And what lies beneath the surface will affect every level of this transition. So what can we do about it? Ladies and gentlemen, we present Deep Sense Technologies. Deep Sense Technologies LLC was founded in 2017 by a group of UVM researchers and partnered with the ARC team. We have the goal of becoming and developing the future of underground mapping. What we are offering is a 3D patented system of mapping and scanning, which will give critical information to the designers and engineers that are dealing with these construction projects. Compared to current solutions on the market, we would be taking surveying time 
from weeks to days and taking accuracy from feet to centimeters. With the included risk in construction, we be taking the scale from millions of dollars to thousands. Now, imagine a world where projects, their schedules didn't go on the scale of years, where projects, budgets didn't go over on the scale of millions of dollars. For us, DeepSense Technologies is so much more than just the technologies. For us, we are going to be the foundation of a sustainable future. So how are we going to get there? Well, since 2017, DeepSense Tech has conducted multiple successful pilot programs with local municipalities and utilities using their existing MVP technology platform to demonstrate the value of these solutions as well as to refine the technology in the field with real clients. In the last several months, our team has conducted over 50 customer discovery interviews to better understand the challenges and the opportunities in these fields. And these customer discovery interviews have identified multiple qualities which our end users find highly valuable but are also highly dissatisfied with current solutions. Along the bottom, for example, is pothole digging excavation. This is essentially digging up these utilities manually in order to verify their location. And while highly effective, this is also very time consuming, very costly, and sometimes even poses a threat to the very utilities that it's intended to protect. Along the middle, ground penetrating radar and induction locating can remotely scan from the surface. However, they suffer from issues in reliability and accuracy, as well as requiring a high degree of expertise in order to analyze and interpret this information. Our business model is to partner with an existing underground surveying equipment provider in order to integrate our technology into a new product line which would deliver these solutions to surveyors and engineers in the field. And moving forward, we're seeking to scale with industry partners in integration, manufacturing, as well as future pilot projects with paying customers. This graph represents our projected revenue over the next five years. Our target market is worth nearly $8 billion and is increasing at a rate of 5% every year. Not to mention that as previously presented, the demand for infrastructure is increasing rapidly. This trend will only further increase demand for a next generation solution. This is where we see ourselves taking the venture over the next two years. This spring, our focus has been on market research and business model planning. Going into the summer, we'll be shifting our focus on cultivating partnerships with letters of intent, um, getting our, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> bringing out the technical expertise we need to uh, develop a market ready product and getting, collaborating with investors. So, sorry everyone. Um, to you got this, you got Come on. Three things. Three All right, so there's three, goal, there's three points that we need to, do, to achieve our, the three points that we believe will um, define our success with this venture include um, integrating our technology into a market-ready product line, becoming completely economically sustainable within three years of product launch, and having our solutions adopted by one of the top five serving companies in the United States. The important resources we need to achieve these three goals are outlined here as personnel, resources, and partnerships. So at the core of our venture are the people. This is our technical research team bringing decades of expertise in electromagnetic scanning and mapping systems, as well as circuits and signal designs, ground penetrating radar, and prototyping. Partnered with us, the ARC team in business and entrepreneurship, with myself, Will Jeffries, leading this commercialization effort. Myself, with Sarah Lawton, leading customer discovery analysis. Myself, Patrick Mann, as the technical development strategist. And me, Tommaso DiDio, leading the business development. Along with a circle of advisors, which bring expertise in instrumentation manufacturing, digital mapping, entrepreneurship, and business development. And along the way, we've been supported by numerous local business hubs. We've also completed two i training series, been consulting with Vermont Small Business Development Center, and most recently, 
were accepted into VentureWell's E-Team program, which offers the opportunity to earn up to $25,000 worth of funding for our venture this summer. So to quickly recap, we are an underground scanning and mapping solution with $3.6 million already invested in research and testing with more to come. We're seeking to scale this venture now to a national level. And tonight, we're looking for your input on how to do this, as well as strategic advisors, industry connections, and your feedback on this pitch. Thank you again for your time. Any questions we can take? Yeah, can you talk a little bit about what the product technology actually is, like the scanning, the mapping software and hardware and stuff? Sure. So ours would be a scanning platform, remote sensing that runs over the job site in order to collect data on, let me just bring back to a relevant slide. There we go. So it's a scanning platform. Essentially imagine a cart or a small vehicle that you're running over a job site using the sensors on board in order to scan underneath the surface, detect the location and position of these utilities, and then provide a digital 3D map as the output of that, which will be provided to your engineers and your surveying teams. Now, the specific technology and sensors in this can vary. Depending on where we identify our specific beachhead market, changes slightly what configuration of sensors. But part of what's great about this research team is they've been working in this field for decades. And so they have a whole suite of sensors at their disposal, and one of the important pieces of their technology is being able to tie these together so that the weak points of one sensor system can be compensated for another, and you can create the perfect solution for any situation. But in the end, it would be a single platform with a specific suite of sensors manufactured with an industry partner provided to a surveyor. That's an excellent question. There's been a lot of questions from our customer discovery interviews about centralized databases of maps. Now this is something that our company may be able to provide in the areas that our sensors are used. A larger system, however, may be something more like a national program where states are able to collaborate together. But it's an excellent question that we've heard a lot of in our customer discovery. I would say um, it definitely depends on the soil conditions. Uh, what we've tested up to, due to the different types of, <clears throat> excuse me, different types of sur surveying methods, traditionally ground penetrating radar can go up to 100 feet, uh, which in totally unsaturated, no water and uh, sandy or rock conditions, we could go up to 100 for just GPR. But Depth is a, a very tough one to navigate because of the very the various soil conditions and water contents of the ground. So it depends, like we said, for the beachhead market, where we're doing it. And that's why we have the multiple centers. So it really is dependent on the conditions of the soil. Can you differentiate fluids? Uh, do you mean like what type of fluids? Mm -hmm. Can I figure that out? That is something we are currently, uh, the researchers are currently looking into. Uh, one huge market is broken pipes uh, with the whole market of maintaining different utilities. That is a huge one of detecting, oh, is it going to be leaking in this area? Another thing GPR has traditionally been used for is once uncovered, they can look at what's inside of a concrete pipe to see if it's natural gas, if it is oil um, or electricity, one could say. Uh, second. So would, uh, if I were a construction company, would I be hiring you to come out and actually do the like, investigation and the scanning, or would you be leasing me the equipment and having to mm. train somebody to do that, or how would that work? In our current business model, we would be partnering with a manufacturer to provide the equipment. And from what we've heard, most organizations are uh, contracting out the services of surveying to third parties. 
So we would be supplying the equipment to those third parties. However, some larger organizations, municipalities, construction companies do have their own in-house surveying crews. So those would again be some of our end users. And What the researchers have said is that their current system is eight to 10 times faster than the current surface scanning methods, as well as being more accurate in identifying, especially through difficult soil conditions. Now, there's also a visualization aspect that uh, no competitors have where we can uh, put the data scanned into a tablet or augmented reality as kind of like x-ray vision into the ground. Mm -hmm. No one else is doing that, obviously, because it's really high tech stuff, but we'll bring that to the market.